Hi, everyone. All right. Microphone's on. Uh, as Abby said, my name is Jerry. I run the Swordsmanship Museum and Academy, and I came all the way from this mythical faraway land called Michigan to be here today. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, never thought my swords would take me this far away, but hooray, fantastic. Um, I want to, even though I'm up here on stage, I want to let you guys know that I really prefer my presentations to be a bit interactive. So at any point during the presentation, if you have a question about something that's relevant to what we're talking about, please pull a first grader. Uh, I can see you, the house lights are all on, so don't, don't worry about that. Uh, and just raise your hand and ask your question. Just make sure you do it with a loud voice, because so, I can't like jump down there and say, what? Uh, but please, please ask your questions. And then if you do have a question that pops up, we are gonna have a question and answer section at the very end of the presentation too. So keep your non-relevant questions for that section uh, and we'll go over everything that we possibly can. Sound good? Okay. Hooray, awesome. So uh, this presentation is very special. They, they normally, uh, when I give this presentation, I just kind of show off the different types of weapons that pirates would have used during the golden age of piracy, but they specifically asked me to do a presentation on the actual sword fighting techniques of the pirates, and I went, yes, this is so cool. So I'm so happy to be able to bring that to you. It's a very special presentation we made exclusively for this program and, and the Pasco District Library and all of that. Uh, so cool, it's fantastic. So. To start things off, I need to lay out a bit of groundwork for us. We need to understand what pirates are and what specifically we're talking about. And I want to clarify, there's always been pirates. Whenever there is someone on water that is carrying expensive things, <laughs> there's always, yeah, that's, that's pretty much been human history, there will always be pirates. The earliest record we ever have of pirates comes from ancient Egypt type of people called the river folk, and that's pretty much all we know about them. Uh, well, yay, history, <laughs> knowledge. Uh, and then, of course, we have modern-day pirates that are struggling to survive and going to extreme methods just like the pirates during the Golden Age of Piracy did. Uh, but we are specifically talking about the Golden Age of Piracy. That's your Yarmady style pirates. Uh, and we're going to specifically talk about the year 1615 to the year 1730. That's kind of the, the era that historians think... Uh, quantifies the golden age of piracy well. There will be a test, so make sure you're taking notes. <laughs> I have to do my due diligence. I have to make sure I, I put the professional years in there. Uh, but I do also need to let you know the world that these pirates were in, the world of the late 17th century uh, and early 18th century. And this is right at the high point of colonialism. Uh, and just to clarify what that is, this, this idea of colonies is where a European nation, specifically and usually when we're talking about the New World, when we're talking about North, Central, and South America, we're talking about England, France, the Netherlands, and especially Spain. Spain is the big player in the mid-1600s, due mostly to the absolutely horrible, horrible, inhumane conquests of the conquistadors. Uh, which, yes, you guys have local history here, which is super cool to you because I'm up in Michigan where our history is like, this guy made a road. <laughs> right? So you're right in the thick of it. I love it. Uh, wish I had Michigan conquistadors. Uh, but in any case, these colonies that were set up, I want you to, to understand that this should be seen like the frontier, that it, like the wilderness, like the American West, this lawless land that is so far removed from any, por uh, any point of central government that there really isn't laws and regulations. It's kind of a wild place. And in order to be one of the Europeans that goes to the colonies, you first, you're not going to be going to the colonies if you yourself are successful over in England or over in Paris. If you own a business or you own an enterprise and you, you're raking in that dough, I'm not going to the colonies. No way. But if you try to survive in Europe, whatever European country and city you want to focus on, and you fail and you hit rock bottom, 
and you've got nothing going on, the colonies are your second chance. The colonies are where you'd escape to. And so if you are able to do that, now just to, just to put, a, put an idea of how bad the people's lives would have to be, one of the things that they would uh, usually do is this type of indentured servitude. Uh, what that would mean is if there is a wealthy, successful business or enterprise owner over in Europe, and you are at rock bottom, you would usually sign yourselves up to be a servant, basically an unpaid farmer or something like that, laborer, for this wealthy person for something like five years. And then when that five-year contract is up, you're free and you've made it and you're, you're, already, you're already in the colonies, and that's when you can start your new life. And that just goes to show how, how rock bottom these, these guys would have to be in order to go to the colonies. And this was pretty much the regular thing. Um, but I'm going to blow your mind a little bit here. Uh, because I'm going to jump into, I'm going to jump into pirates real quick. And by the way, before I, before I talk about this, I do want to point out that what we have on the tables here is a collection of replicas and original artifacts of weapons, swords, and knives, that were in use during the golden age of piracy. And I'll be sure to clarify what I'm using, uh, if it's an artifact or if it's a replica. And after the presentation, if you want to get a nice close up view of them, I don't know, maybe I'll bring it to the edge of the stage or something like that. <laughs> um, so we're going to be using these weapons as the foundation and structure for the story of the golden age of piracy. Because everyone likes swords, they really do. Park yourself in a public park just for like an hour and just watch a couple kids play. And inevitably, one of those kids will pick up a stick. And that stick could be anything. That stick could be a magic wand. It could be a fishing rod. It can be a conductor's baton. But no, what is it 100% of the time? A sword. Yeah, exactly right. It was always for me. But that just goes to show that even though these these Sticks could be anything. Uh, they automatically go to swords. It means we automatically, we as humans, automatically have a curiosity about swords. What, how do you fight with them? What would draw someone to fight hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, right up close to their opponent and, and willingly, you know, <laughs> them? It's, it's scary. It's weird. And so it's that curiosity that we all have that I want to take advantage of. I want to use that curiosity to explain to you deeper levels of history and culture through the vehicle of swords. Make sense? Yay, swords! swords. And also history and culture. <laughs> so to start things off, we're talking about the early point of the golden age of piracy. We're talking about colonies. And I want to point out, and I said it again, I'll say it before and I'll say it again, at this point, and we're talking about the mid-1600s, Spain is your big boy. Spain is your big country with the massive amount of colonies, with just a speckling of little French and English and Dutch colonies in the, colon in the, in the Caribbean. The reason that Spain was so powerful and so successful is, one, yes, the conquistadors conquered everything and ruined cultures. Uh, but also, apparently, Spain in the colonial era really, really, really liked the Galactic Empire from Star Wars. That, pretty much the same thing. Uh, so, just not stormtroopers. They had tricorn hats. So, Spain was the, pretty much the only power in the colonies that was worth anything. And you have to remember that these European countries were sending their population over into these cities. Most, this is the frontier, most of the land over in the colonies, both in the mainland Central America and the islands, was this really unwelcoming, horrible wilderness, a rainforest, the tropics. It's not good to be out there. And Spain just kind of kept all its people in these cities. But they needed a food source in order to support these cities. So instead of going through these massive issues of creating pastures with fences and regulations on where someone's property started and ended, Spain essentially brought a whole bunch of cows and a bunch of hogs, or pigs, over, and then went, go, be free, have fun, and just tried to implant this kind of invasive cow and pig population on these islands. 
Uh, and, you know, whenever they needed some, they'd go out and grab some and voila, feed their people. And they saw everything, not just the land, but also the pigs and the cows and everything, and even the ability to work on it as being owned by the Spanish Empire. And enter, and I'm going to blow your minds, did you know that there are multiple kinds of pirates? Very, very, and you're actually familiar with the name of this first one, but you might not have realized that it actually meant a different type, a specific type of pirate. And the name of these guys are the Buccaneers. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, eventually, yes, eventually the word Buccaneer just meant anyone who was a pirate. But at this point, the Buccaneers were a very specific group. What they were was normally mostly French pirates, and what they would do is they would set up encampments. And when I say encampments, I don't mean like little villages. I mean literal like fabric tents on the far side of the island away from the Spanish cities. And these buccaneers would be illegal hunters. They would go out and they would hunt the pigs and the cows that the Spanish would let free on their islands. And they would take it back to their camps and they would use a process that preserved that meat and also gave the buccaneers their name. Because buccaneer is actually an anglicized version of the French word boucanier. Boucanier means someone who uses a bucken. What's a bucken? Please don't make the joke, the buccaneer, please. <laughs> Horrible. A bucken or boucan is a structure that you would build, various sizes, they can be small, they can be massive, that you would build over a fire, a very smoky fire. And they would put the carved up slabs of meat, the pig and the cow, in the bukan, and the bukan would have a roof and it would catch all the heat and all the smoke from the fire underneath it, and you would essentially flavor it, cook it, and dry it all at the same time, creating some sort of pirate beef jerky. Mm. And that was especially good for being on a ship, because when you're on a ship, food goes bad real fast. And they would never sell to the Spanish. They don't want to sell to the Spanish. The Spanish are trying to try to kick them out or kill them or something. Uh, and so they would only sell to the, the folks who are in the Caribbean who are not Spanish. So we're talking about the English, the Dutch, and the French. And more often than not, if you come across a ship in Spanish colonial waters that isn't Spanish, they're probably there to fight the Spanish. No one liked the Spanish. Spanish liked the Spanish uh, at this point. So these buccaneers became allies, essentially, to these invading powers. And not only would they be, be you know, selling their, their meat to, to supply the, the ships, but they would also be hiring their services, not just as guides, because they do know the area, but also as crack shots. Because these buccaneers used a type of gun referred to as a fusil buccanier, or buccaneer gun. Yay, archaeologists know how to name things. But it's actually pretty fascinating, and obviously I can't bring one of those on a plane. But they normally are a smoothbore musket that is six to seven feet long. And the idea of that, remember this is smoothbore muskets. They, they didn't spin when they shot out like our modern day rifles. They were just a ball in a tube, so when you fire it, it kind of goes You kind of hope it hits. But the idea was the longer the barrel, the more accurate your shot was. And so these guys were hunters, crack shots, and they would have their long muskets, and they would fire at pigs and cows, or sometimes Spanish. But they were also really good at one other thing. And I'm going to bring that out. This is our first artifact that we're going to be looking at today. And unfortunately for you, it's really small. So you can come and get a nice close look at it later on. What we have here is an original... Uh, late 17th century or early 18th century hunting knife. It's very, very pretty. It has a very thin and unfortunately worn for wear blade. And it has an antler grip. And in a horrible sense of irony, it has a brass butt cap that is embellished with designs of beautiful little cherubs. Hmm. <laughs> it's very rigid too, very solid. Now, this is the type of knife that these buccaneers, buccanier, would be using because they were hunters. They, they needed a wide variety of knives in order to properly skin and carve and process all of the meat that they're illegally hunting. 
And most of the period depictions of buccaneers that we see have them with a big pouch on their hip and just sticking out of it is just every knife handle you could possibly think of. Where if someone were walking down the street today with this thing on their hip, you'd be like, okay, buddy. They also uh, would have another type of knife that I'll be using, and that's this one. Anyone want to get a, give a guess as to what type of knife this might be? Sword, dagger? Thoughts? Anyone else? Good guesses so far. I'm, chicken thing, that's a good guess too. What this actually is, is a bayonet. And a bayonet, for those of you who don't know, is a type of knife or blade that gets affixed to the end of a gun. Or in this case, this doesn't get affixed to the end of, this goes right in the end of it. This is the earliest form of bayonet that we have in history. This is called a plug bayonet. And it's called the plug bayonet because plugs right into the end of your gun. Uh, and it, it sticks in there, and it basically turns your big musket, your fusil boucanier, with a bayonet at the end of it into this weird, awkward spear. Which is kind of neat, because pole arms are the real champions of the battlefield. So not only could you shoot at someone and then waste, you know, not waste a minute trying to reload that thing, you just put a blade in the end of it, and now you have a pole arm. Pretty neat, I like that. But you can also use this as a standalone knife. And here's where I want to talk about sword fighting, or knife fighting in this case. What I use, and I want to point this out too, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, there is a massive world out there researching surviving sword fighting and weapon fighting manuals. What I mean by that is thanks to museums and archives, linguists, translators, and publishers, we have access to actual books written by actual swordsmen from a time when sword fighting meant life or death that has survived the centuries, and more often than not, it needs to be translated so we can understand it in our modern day gross English. Uh, and really understand how sword fighting worked. No longer do we have to find some random jerk on YouTube who thinks he's able to identify the top five sword fights in movies. No, we know it, we have the book. But there's problems with that, and I'll get to that as this presentation goes on, but I do wanna let you know about knives. Because in the 18th century, I did a lot of research in preparation for this. In the 17th century, late 17th century, I tried to find knife fighting manuals that would explain how the buccaneers might have fought, and I came up empty handed. No luck at all, but you know what I did find? A Scottish manual, mostly for sword fighting, but it did have, get this, one whole page <laughs> for knife fighting. And you want to know what it looked like? It was two guys facing each other doing this. <laughs> Hooray, I'm a colonial knife fighter now. <laughs> and it real, the words were just like, and you hold your knife at his breast as such. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of details on how they would have used their knives, but we know they did. The Buccaneers were very good knife fighters. Now, one thing I do want to point out, too, is that in all the research that I've found, I have, I've only ever seen even visual depictions, paintings, and battle images, and things like that. I've only ever seen folks holding knives of any variety like this, blade up. I do want to point out that, yes, it is possible to hold your knife blade down in the ice pick grip, as it's called today, but that's actually more popular earlier in human history, in the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, when you do have armor that you have to get through. You have to be able to puncture or get unusual angles, but you don't have to worry about that in the colonial era. Armor is out the window, and so you hold it in a much more practical knife fighting method. We haven't had any questions so far. I wanna remind you guys, you can always ask questions. So. Um, any case, knife fighting, hooray. Now, there's one other weapon I want to bring up, too, that's also French from this era, or it's actually a lot of folks, but one particular pirate likes to use it well, and that's this guy right here. Oh, yes, this is our first. I, oh, look at this. Perfect. It protects your hand. 
This is our first weapon that we're, our first true weapon that we're going to be talking about, rather than like a knife that's a tool, primarily. Yeah, you cut chicken and hogs and Spaniards. <laughs> but this weapon right here, historians refer to this weapon as a clamshell cutlass. You can see why they call it a clamshell, right? They're very good at naming things. So good. <laughs> But what's neat about this is we actually have a surviving book written in the late 1600s that goes over the different types of pirates that were active in the Caribbean at the time. So you have to understand, even though Europe was an ocean away, Europe knew piracy was going on. And they, had a, they were going through their own little pirate craze over in England at the time. You get stage productions that were made about pirates. You get books that were published about pirates. And some of these actually have period depictions of pirates. And one French pirate uh, who was active in the Caribbean at this time goes by the name of Francois Le Lenoir. You can tell he's French. Uh, and his... his portrait that they chose to pick him uh, to describe him as in this book looks a little bit like this <laughs> he also has a twirly mustache it's great he looks much better than i do doing it now while the rest of the world is probably looking at his wonderful portrait and looking at his beautiful eyes and his swarthy demeanor i'm looking at the sword and i go oh, yeah primary source depictions of swords yes <laughs> We know what type of sword he uses, and it's this. Now, the cool thing is, this clamshell cutlass comes from a long lineage of actual sword-type development. Uh, we, don't actually, we don't often get that. A lot of people in the world today will give you this weird, like, barfingly similar, a, a simple overview of swords. Like, well, first they had the crossguard sword, and then they realized they wanted more hand protection, so they added a complex hilt and got a side sword, and then they wanted to stab people farther, so they made a rapier. It doesn't work that way. But we do occasionally get examples where you can see the development. And the progenitor of this sword was one that was called a Messer. Anyone speak German out there? Messer? Knife, exactly right. The Messer was a late 1400s into the early 1500s type of sword that was constructed like a, like a steak knife. Two slats on either side of the handle held together with rivets, uh, but it was big. <laughs> it wasn't a little knife, it was a big knife. But the thing that made it unique was that it actually had, the first time ever in human history, you have a sword that is three-dimensional. It didn't just, or in European history, I should clarify, Western history. So it didn't just have the two cross guards going across the side, it actually had a third cross guard sticking off the side this way, which was called a noggle, which translates to? Nail. Close. <laughs> Nail is what I've been told. I don't know if that's the same as modern German, but that's old high medieval German. Uh, and it's just this third little cross guard, but it changed the world of swords. Not only did swords only have the choice between curved and not curved and cross guard or not cross guard, now you can make it three-dimensional. And as the years continue, that noggle grew and became larger and wider like a fan, and it turned into a Renaissance-era curved sword called a dussek. And as the years continue, they kind of simplified it and turned it into the clamshell cutlass. But what's neat is we have... Da -da -da -da, Primary sources of a surviving swordsmanship manual from the golden age of piracy that show you how to fight with the clamshell cutlass. Hooray, I love it. What did actually, oh, question, yes? Uh, how much does, mostly, do they weigh? That's a really popular question. So for those who didn't hear, how much, how much do swords weigh? Uh, and that, um, it's a really popular question. The reason that's popular, I think, is because there's a lot of people out there who just embellish it like crazy. Uh, up in Michigan, my educators and I have a nice uh, little competition to see how high we can hear other educators claim that swords were. And here's the true story. So we were at a, uh, we were at a Scottish festival, Scottish Heritage Festival. And at these Scottish Heritage Festivals, the different clans have different, like, tents representing their little clan culture and heritage. It's kind of neat. Um, and they all, every single one of them has a sword in it. Every single one, because everyone likes the Scottish swords. And we went to one once, and this guy was giving a presentation. 
and he pulled out a, a two-handed sword, and he gives this talk, and he says, these Scottish Highland swords were so heavy that only the strongest Highlanders could wield them. These swords weighed 90 pounds. Bro, have you ever picked up 90 pounds? <laughs> Apparently he had, because he actually had a reason behind it. He actually said, these swords were so heavy, and I kid you not, I'm not making this up. You can't make this stuff up. It was so heavy that the Scottish Highlanders could only attack from above because once it hit the ground, it was too heavy to pick up again. So apparently it was a one-time use sword. <sighs> we hear this all the time. It actually, believe it or not, it was 40 pounds. Then it upped to 50 pounds. Then it upped to 90 pounds. So this competition is ongoing. But the rule of thumb for proper historical sword weight is roughly one pound per foot of weapon. So this sword here would probably weigh somewhere between a foot and a half, uh, weigh a foot and a half, uh, weigh about a pound and a half, two pounds, somewhere around that area. It's not heavy. You don't want a heavy sword. You want a light and quick and fast sword because these swords are not crushing, they're not chopping, they're slicing. You need finesse, you need to be able to work with it. So if you can take that rule of thumb, one pound per foot of sword, and picture a 90-pound sword. <laughs> it's a little joking. So, um, so no, these are, these are light. Swords are meant to be light. Uh, in fact, this one, you might be asking yourself, why does the clamshell only have one shell on it? Why doesn't it have a shell on the other side? Well, it's true they did have shells on both sides or examples. Frequently, they would only have one protecting the back of your hand so that you can wear it on your hip because you'd be wearing this throughout the day frequently, especially if you're on campaign. So it's, it's all about practicality. And as we go through, you'll see that pirates are, are very practical folks. Does that answer your question? Go ahead. Both of you are, are shaking. Sure. I'm noticing that the clamshell handle, the shield, it almost seems to indicate right-handed use. Yes. So the, the, the identification or the, notif the, the observation was that uh, the clamshell being over the back of my right hand would indicate that it is made for right-handed people. Uh, and that's definitely true because if I were to hold this in my left hand, wouldn't give me a lot of protection. Oh, well, I certainly could use this, and as you'll see, we'll pull up other swords that are, you know, parallel, uh, um, but uh, this particular one is only for right-handed. And as we go through the historical manuals and all the research I've done, the earliest time I've ever found a sword master who wrote a book that actually mentioned lefties and how to fight with the left-handed style was in the late 1800s. So if you're a pirate and you're a lefty, sorry. <laughs> so better learn to fight ambidextrously. <laughs> Last question. What have you got, my friend? Um, um, where did you get the swords? Where did I get the swords? Once upon a time, someone told me when I was first starting my museum. They said, you're not a real museum until someone gives you all of their unwanted junk. And at the time, I was like, oh, man, I wish people would give me their unwanted junk. And now we just get tons and tons of swords just donated. And usually the story is, I found this in my grandfather's Closet, I don't really know what it is. Do you want it? And I say, <laughs> awesome. So, um, but this particular one is a replica. I'm very comfortable swinging it around because I bought it online. Hooray, specifically for this. Uh, but just, if you're looking to purchase yourself a sword, a high quality sword, don't. <laughs> Ask yourself why. Anyway, I digress. Let's get back on track. Here's how to fight with a clamshell cutlass. And this is recorded in a manual written by a guy named, uh, what was his name? Erolini Verocelli. Who, of course, you can tell what country he's from, right? Yeah, right, Germany. Yeah, he, he was German. It blew my mind when I first figured that out. It, so, it sounds Italian, yeah, for sure. Uh, 
But no, this was actually a German manual published in the year 1679, and it tells you how to fight with a sword like this, and it's fantastic. Here's a little bit of an example. Uh, his work has you fight with this through a series of what are called guards, and a guard is a way that you hold your body, your weapon, uh, and your stance that gives you either offensive, defensive, or strategic benefits. So in English, some of these guards are, for example, the fool guard or the plow guard. We have the boar guard, oh, I'm sorry, boar guard, the steer guard, and I kid you not, this next guard is hilarious. I kid you not, it, in German it's called the Zornhut, but in English that translates to the wrath guard. <laughs> yes, they were edgy back then too. Uh, and that's back here where you literally have your sword over your right shoulder, and the idea is you would throw forward your right foot for a downward diagonal cut. And by doing that, you're able to put your entire body weight behind that cut. Rather than just kind of a, huh, you're able to put some actual force behind it for your cuts. But it's not just going between one guard to another guard. Very not cool. There's actually some flow involved to it, and I want to demonstrate one particular technique that is called the plunge cut, and it demonstrates the flow that you would see in this style of sword fighting. So we'd start off here in the wrath guard, and I'm going to be looping. It's going to look like I'm going to do a downward diagonal cut, but in reality, it's going to loop around behind and attack from an opposite angle, and at full speed, it looks like this. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I actually, uh, we were doing a, uh, a sword fighting tournament over in Michigan, and I totally smoked the leader of a different club with that technique. It was great. <laughs> but the reason why is because if I'm fighting you and you see me like this, you're going to think, ah, oh, my cut is going to come this way. So if I'm my own opponent, which I always am, I would block like this to prevent that cut from hitting me. But if I'm doing the plunge cut, it looks like I'm going to start with that cut, but I'm looping it around and attacking from a different quadrant, getting around your opponent's defense. It's really smart. There's a lot of tactics. It's like super, super chess. Next time uh, your friend wants to challenge you to a chess match, just pull out a couple swords. <laughs> so this is really neat. I love this, and especially because we not only have evidence that it was used by pirates, but also a manual on how to fight with it. It's really cool. Uh, one other weapon that was popular in the buccaneer era was this. This is an original weapon. This is actually probably the oldest weapon in the museum's collection that is a true weapon. Uh, we've got knives and we've got swords, and, or I'm sorry, we've got knives and we've got paper documents, but no swords. This is a sword or a machete. Now, we had a little bit of difficulty identifying this one. Because usually when we have swords that are original artifacts, we would look right here on a part of the sword called the ricasso. That just traditionally is where folks like to put information about who made the sword, where it was made, their last name. If they're proud of it, they'll put their like family crest and stuff in there. And we can do research and we can go, ah, that sword was made in this city by this family in this year. Which tells us okay, stuff about it. <laughs> but this has nothing. And it's probably because this sword is not necessarily very well made. The blade is not very flexible. It has a fake fuller, which is a, uh, normally a, a hole, a groove in the side of the sword that is designed uh, for structure and strength of the blade, but they just kind of did a little etch on it. Like, look, we're quality. And then, of course, we have the hand guards, which is non-existent. I've only ever found one other sword, original sword, that looks similar to this. And believe it or not, I found it on Facebook. Uh, and someone here in Florida said that they found this sword in an old house, as pretty much everyone claims they found a sword in. And it had this exact same handle, this kind of knife slat style handle with the teeny tiny cross guards. And I think that's really cool because I was completely unaware of what this sword might be up until that point. But it does indicate that these swords were made in the colonial era, at least in Florida and probably in Havana and some of the other colonies as well. Uh, but the reason why I like this as 
a pirate sword is because it is not a military sword. You have to remember, pirates were not soldiers. Pirates were not part of a military. They didn't have logistics. They didn't have factories pumping out weapons for them. They had access to whatever a civilian would have access to. And this kind of low quality, uh, I guess you'd call it sort of practical or simplified sword, would be the kind of sword that someone in the colonies would have on them for self-defense, or even maybe for a machete to clear the way through their uh, their land or their farm, or even used on something like a sugarcane plantation. But I love this. This is very cool, and this is the what we might have as a true pirate sword. But you have to keep in mind, there was no one. There, there, we will never ever know if this sword, unless we find it in like a pirate shipwreck, we'll never know if this is truly a pirate sword. You want to know why? because no one walks around and stamps all their equipment going, hi, I'm a murderer, this is the murder weapon. <laughs> no one does that. Pirates were breaking the law. And no one, uh, pirates were breaking the law, sort of. And this introduces our second type of pirate. This is a type of pri uh, pirate that arguably wasn't a pirate. They were called privateers. And what a privateer is, very simply put, is a pirate, or usually a ship owner, who gets what's called a letter of mark. And a letter of mark is basically a contract or a certificate given to them by the royalty of one nation or another, saying, yes, Mr. Not a Pirate, wink, wink, you are an official part of our military, but we're not giving you nothing. But you have free reign to raid any city that you want, as long as it's not us. <laughs> and this happened all the time, but no pirate or privateer was more popular or more successful than Mr. Henry Morgan himself. <laughs> it was actually based, uh, yes, there's, a, there's an alcoholic beverage that's Henry Morgan, but he's actually based on an actual, very successful, buccaneer-era pirate. Henry Morgan did not recruit himself a crew. He didn't even recruit himself a force. Henry Morgan recruited an army. He literally had under his command at one point up to 3,000 pirates, which is insane. And no, not every single one of those pirates had a letter of mark. They were not all privateers. But what he, the reason he got this was because there was a lot of gold. But that gold was not on the ships like you might think. The Spanish kept their gold in fortified cities. Now this gold not only came from plundering the civilizations and cultures like the Aztecs and the Incas that were in the colonial era, or that were in the, the New World, but it was also minted through the enslavement of those native peoples by the Spanish, uh, who forced them to work in gold and silver mines. And so from the New World, Spain just had tons and tons and tons of gold and silver that they were minting into their coinage. And they would keep these coins in these fortified coastal colonial towns until an armada showed up to pick up the gold and bring it back to Spain. Now, you're not gonna have any luck attacking the Armada. You're just not gonna be able to surround a literal military force of the Spanish Navy. So you have to get your gold in another way. And you have to get this gold by attacking those fortified towns. Now, these Spanish towns were fortified in two ways. One, Overlooking the ocean to prevent a massive naval attack, they had giant cannons, watchtowers, and all sorts of in-water defenses to prevent any naval force from attacking. But on the land, they had a different sort of defense, and that was nothing. <laughs> because remember, behind these cities, behind these towns, there was nothing but rainforest and wilderness, diseases, unfriendly natives, and all sorts of obstacles are getting in the way. No army is going to make its way through the back. No army is going to walk overland to these cities, right? 
Henry Morgan did so. And that's where you get, you know, your pirate adventure, traveling through the jungles. And he actually did, on many of his attacks on Porto Bello and many of the other uh, uh, Spanish raids, raids, it's more like an invasion, they would land on the opposite side of the island, march through, have a really minor skirmish with some of the Spanish militia, because the militia were the only ones who were there, you don't have an actual Spanish force. Obviously, they would win, break through, and then they would get all the wealth they possibly could from raiding those towns. There's no defenses, so the, Spaniard, uh, the, the pirates would go in and gather as many goods as they could. And at the same time, they would gather as many survivors as they could. Now, they didn't want to kill these people. No, if you kill someone, they can't tell you where they hid their gold. And so, well, they also wouldn't tell you where they hid their gold willingly. So these uh, early buccaneer pirates were specialists in torture. Horrible methods of torture, usually involving wrapping a piece of fabric around someone's head and tightening it tighter and tighter and tighter until their eyes bulge out of their skull. Hooray! Hi, kids. Uh, they're horrible. They were not fun. But then when they did that, usually people would tell them where their gold was hidden. So they would go and get that gold in addition to their plundering gold. And then to top it all off, they would set up shop right in that horrible town and ransom it off to some other Spanish town. Said, oh, you, wanna, you want your town back? Well, give us even more gold. And then we'll vacate it. And when they got their gold, usually they'd throw a few torches in the town, book it up, and head home just laden with gold. So much gold. And you have to remember that the Spanish coinage was international at this point. Anyone would accept it because it was literal gold and silver. It wasn't like our coins today where it's some random alloy of junk metal. Uh, that literally the wealth of the coin was your wealth, not a representation of it. Uh, so it was good. And these, Spaniards, or these pirates laden with Spanish coin would go back and bring that wealth to any of the other colonies that were in the New World that were not Spanish. That's kind of your iconic method of the buccaneering era. But the irony is Henry Morgan, who was seen as a privateer by the English, but was seen as a horrible vigilante and a pirate by the Spanish, he was actually called back to England, imprisoned, and was being held to be hanged because England wanted to settle things down with Spain. And his... His reputation was so notorious that if Spain saw that England had killed him as, you know, a pirate or hanged him as a pirate, they thought Spain would calm down. So here's Henry Morgan, wasting away in a Tower of London prison, waiting for the day when he would be publicly hanged. He gets notice that he has to come out of his prison cell, and he comes out probably expecting the worst. He sits down in the in the chambers of the king of England. And the king of England says, hey, you want to be governor? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Henry Morgan, in the biggest 180 ever in human history, goes from thinking he's about to be publicly hanged to being the most powerful person in the colonies because he was a privateer, because he was always doing what he did in the name of the king. And apparently, England didn't really care how Spain thought of them at the time. Believe it or not, Henry Morgan actually worked to limit piracy when he was governor. Uh, and it worked. And the buccaneering era ended partially due to Henry Morgan putting a lot of caps and basically turntailing on all of his pirate friends and saying, no, you can't do this anymore. The buccaneering era, which is one of the subsections of the golden age of piracy, ends in about the 1680s, more or less. We then enter a section of the golden age of piracy that I'm going to briefly mention, and this is called the Pirate Round. The Pirate Round is called the Pirate Round because the colonial era in the Caribbean is not necessarily the wealthiest anymore. And the pirates start going across the globe. They enter places of the world like the Cape of Madagascar. They enter the Indian Ocean. They enter sometimes the Pacific and the Asian worlds. Now, this is, and the only reason I'm mentioning this is because we do have accounts of pirates, cliche, 
tricorn hat wearing Yarmady pirates wielding exotic weapons like shamshirs from the Middle East, like tulwars from India, and we even have an account of a Mexican pirate wielding an Indonesian weapon referred to as a kris, which is a wiggly dagger. It's really cool. You get some weird exotic weapons from the pirate round. But I'm only going to briefly talk about that because as much as I would love to give a lecture on literally every weapon ever in human history, I'm not going to bore you with that. So we're going to enter the next era and talk about a few unique weapons that popped up. This last era, which is from about 1710 to about 1730, is referred to as the true golden age of piracy, the real golden age. Uh, and this is where you get all of the cliche, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean style. It's not, I did that for reference, not for actual historical credit. Uh, golden age of piracy fighting. Pirates, not versus Spanish, but versus the English. And this happened because Spain went through a succession crisis. Spain didn't know who their next king would be. They had internal conflict and basically collapsed in upon itself. These colonies are no longer the most powerful countries in the world. And thanks to a few other conflicts, Spain gave most of its colonial land holdings to England. And England used those colonies not necessarily through direct precious metal refining, but by creating a global trade network. We know part of this as the Colombian Exchange, uh, where gold and tobacco and spices and textiles and human beings were traded in this international tri trade triangle. Uh, when that's how England got their wealth. So the gold is no longer in Spanish fortified towns, but the gold is technically in the form of trade goods. These tobacco and the, uh, and the textiles and the slaves that, the, that, were being, that were traveling on the Atlantic world. So we now start seeing a different type of fighting. Not land fighting, not land pirates, but we enter the true ship to ship style combat, and with that, we get some really fascinating weapons. And the first one I want to show you is this right here. Anyone want to take a guess as to what this is? What is this? Right, it's an axe. Anyone want to take a guess as to what type of axe it is? Close, it does look like a tomahawk, but there ain't no way I'm throwing this heavy boy. This is referred to as a boarding axe. Uh, as in boarding, as in you're boarding an enemy ship or your ship is being boarded. You'd pull this guy out and this acts not just as a weapon but also a tool. The tool is useful for if, any, if you see enemy grappling hooks are attached to your ship, you can go ahead and take your axe and cut through it. If you're on the enemy's ship, you can use the axe to cut through the ropes and the rigging to make sure their ship is damaged and not able to sail away. And of course, you can use this to split some skulls, uh, which indeed we have actual primary sources of pirates saying, yes, I use this to split the skull of a midshipman. And you go, ugh. Okay, that was casual. There's also some weird, uh, prim we don't have primary source records on how to actually fight with an ax. Probably because axes aren't really the most strategic or, or, or I suppose you'd say uh, dexterous style of fighting. Usually you do this and you break through everything. <laughs> but there are some ship manuals, ship, like seamanship manuals, that describe that if you need to, you can take about 12 of these and you can take the pokey bit and slam it into the side of your enemy ship, one on top of the next, and you make it a little ladder that you can climb up. I don't know if I trust that. <laughs> I don't, but it's in the manual. So it's there, primary sources, hooray. Uh, if you do want to fight with an ax, please keep in mind that you're not going to barbarian this thing and do this kind of like downward, ugh and then try to like lift it back up by throwing your elbow out at the same time, you actually want to have a bit of flow. Because unlike swords, where the weight is in the back by the pommel and the handguard, and you have a nice, light, flexible blade, the weight of the axe is in the top. And so the best way to fight is to keep that axe in motion using body mechanics and flow to keep 
that head in motion. And you do want to slow it up or speed it up with little rotations from the elbow, shoulder, and wrist so that you don't enter in a rhythmic pattern. If you have a pattern, if you're in a rhythmic pattern, your enemy can kind of go, oh, it's like a song, and then break that pattern and cut you while your axe is behind you. So you do want to have a bit of variation in how you swing it and that speed. That's all theoretical, I should say, because we don't have primary sources on it. But what we do have is primary sources on a different type of sword. So in this era, we have a massive split between the two halves of swords that were popular. We have swords like this one, which we'll get to, which is on one end of the spectrum. It's called the small sword. And then you have swords on the other end of the spectrum, like this one, which is referred to as a broadsword. Broadsword is a wide category of swords that pretty much says anything that isn't a small sword. Yay, categories. But most of these little personal swords, little curved foot soldier rather than cavalryman swords, fall into a category called hanger. And they're called hangers because they hang down on your hip. Yay, naming. <laughs> Don't overcomplicate this, folks. But this particular one is one of the popular types of swords that were used with pirates. And once again, we have examples of pirates fighting with these and a book on how to use it. So let me tell you the story of what this particular sword is. This sword is referred to as a hunting sword. And it pretty much has the story that you'd expect, so let me tell the story for you. Remember, this is the 1700s. This is the era of the dandy gentleman with the tricorn hat and the powdered wig and the big froofy coat. <laughs> yes, I am masculine. <laughs> and we want to represent ourselves as the gentleman warriors that we are. <laughs> and so we're going to do gentlemanly activities like hunting wild beasts. <laughs> But of course, I don't have the time to learn all those outdoorsman techniques. So let me get on my horse like the old buglers of old and the knights of old, and I will hire myself some outdoor woodsman to lead this hunting expedition for me. And so if you can picture this wonderful, well-dressed, super expensive and very gaudy and impractical gentleman, <laughs> is on horseback, and he has to bring with him this wonderful, fantastic sword, because it's wealthy. Look at how decorated it's in, beautiful, love it. I'm gonna show off, because this is a sword for hunting. And it's used in the following manner. So here we are, on horseback, and we have hired our guides. Mm, yes, and here we are, walking through the wilderness. Oh, guides, have you spotted our quarry yet? Mm, my lord. I see our quarry, our prey, a deer over in yonder valley. Would you like me to mark it for you? Oh, yes, please. Kapow! And the outdoorsman, or the guide, or whatever you want to say, who is probably uh, from the lower class, uh, which would be indicated the difference between literacy and illiteracy, or ability to read and inability to read or had an education, and that lower class guide who was hired on probably intentionally shot that prey, that deer, in a non-lethal area, in the rump or the leg or something like that, so that they can track it. And that they finally track this poor helpless animal, miles and miles, until it's exhausted due to blood loss and it's just laying there. My lord, here is your prey. Oh yes, let me dismount. <laughs> Fair creature, I shall dispatch you in the most honorable way possible, with a sword. <laughs> All that flourishing made my microphone fall off. There. Uh, and so the nobleman has used his hunting sword all by his own, without any help from anyone else, to dispatch his prey uh, with the sword. That's pretty much the case on how it goes, and that's the way that this sword would be intentionally used. However, 
This, saying that this sword was not good against people is like saying a modern-day hunting rifle couldn't be used against people. It most certainly could. And it certainly was, because just like the machete weapon that we saw from the buccaneering era, this was your civilian weapon. This was the sword that you can go over to ye olde colonial Walmart and pick up a version of, especially if you had to join a pirate crew, which often required the members to bring their own weapons. So this hunting sword was the iconic weapon of the time, now, you'll notice that it, unlike the machete, it does have this brand new thing uh, called hand protection. It's not actually brand new. We've seen this pop up before, but for whatever reason, the blades in this era had very minimal hand protection. If you look right here, it has this wonderful thing called a knuckle bow. And that knuckle bow is supposed to protect your knuckles. Supposed to protect your knuckles. I don't trust this at all. And you see that in the sword fighting styles at the time. Now, you remember I mentioned that the lower class uh, was usually defined as being illiterate at this time. Also, the lower class was associated with broadswords, hunting swords, hangers. The upper class would have a different weapon, which we'll get to later. So why would anyone waste their time writing a book on how to use a sword wielded by people who didn't know how to read? And that leads to a lot of issues, a lot of issues. For example, in this true golden age of piracy, you want to know how many books I've found on how to fight with a broadsword? One. <laughs> but it's so glorious, it's so perfect, that I have to introduce it to you guys here. Now, the author of this book, which was published in the year 1711 in England, the author of this book never says he's a pirate but he might be, because he gives us some hints. And my first hint is probably not intentional by him, but I swear this guy, if, he, if there was a contest for who has the most piratey name ever in history, this guy wins first place. This book was published by a guy named Zach Wild. <laughs> Pirates of Caribbean music. There he is, Zach Wild, on the high seas. He also uses conjunctions like EM for them and ER for there and O apostrophe ER for over. And so you're like, are you a pirate? <laughs> Zach, <laughs> you a pirate? He also has techniques such as the grand compass and other kind of naval sounding terms. So let me explain how Zach Wild wants us to fight with the broadsword question. Compare junk and history. All junk is history. Maybe not yours. If there is an accessory, or have you come across an accessory that would be um, like in addition to one of these swords that doesn't have one of these hand shields that would maybe slide over the blade itself and create the shield? Oh, okay. So the question was have you encountered any? Uh, kind of add-on, kind of customization for a sword that you could kind of give you the hand protection over top of it. The answer is no. I have not yet come across this. This is also, there's a, it's hard to, we are a very practical people here in the Western world in the 21st century. Practicality is like golden top tier. It wasn't necessarily the case back then. Pirates themselves were practical, but they were also not industrial. They didn't really have like, all right, here's your slide over handguard. In fact, the only swords from this era that had true proper hand protection were the Scottish basket-hilted broadswords. The rest of the world were having these wimpy little, your hands protected style swords. Uh, however, I do want to point out that there are technically primary sources from after the Golden Age of Piracy, but from the naval world. Uh, there's a couple depictions that show naval soldiers, and these are true Navy soldiers, not, or Marines, not pirates, but they have forearm protection, almost like little sheets of metal that they've strapped to their forearm, which is kind of cool. I mean, this is armor from the era way after armor was supposed to be around. Uh, the only thing is, there's literally from like two pieces of art, and that's it. We don't even know what they're called. We don't have any surviving examples, so we're not really sure. 
Uh, the other thing is published in the early 1800s, we have a guy named Pringle who was a naval officer in the English Navy, and he says it was really popular for naval soldiers at the time to fire their pistol and then literally yeet it onto the ship uh, before drawing your sword so that it wasn't in the way. And he says, no, 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 once your, shit, uh, once your shot has been fired, don't throw your gun, hold it in your offhand and hold it so the barrel is downward over your forearm so you can use it like protection. That's kind of cool. I think that's neat. It's technically after the golden age of piracy, but it's a little bit of practicality that I really appreciate. Uh, but no, I haven't yet found that. But let me tell you how Zach Wilde uh, wanted, to, wanted to fight. And this is from his book in 1711. Now he tells us that you want to have your dominant foot right foot in my case, and probably Zach Wilde's case, pointed right at your opponent. And you want your left foot equidistant, right behind your right foot, but stance parallel. You should hold your sword straight out in front of you, and then you should bend both your front knee to the front and your rear knee to the side, entering what I can only call as a swordsman squat. He also does want your left hand up on your chest like this. So this is your proper Zach Wilde Golden Age of Piracy broadsword stance, which is kind of cool. I mean, I like it because if I'm on a ship rocking back and forth, I at least can kind of move my body and flow with it. Now, if you do have your hand out in front of you, probably to give you some distance between you and your opponent, but when he tells you that he wants you to cut, he actually wants you to bring your sword back behind your head and then step forward to do the cut. And once your cut is finished, you follow through with it, or at least bring your sword back immediately before you're, so you're able to parry and then throw another cut. Parry, cut, parry, cut, cut. And you see how my hand is only out extended for about half a second? That's because I ain't got no hand protection. Oh, wow, that was cool. <laughs> uh, so this sword, this style of sword fighting is intentionally done because we don't have that hand protection. We don't have that uh, guard. Because in what I mentioned before with the Scottish basket hilt, which the earliest style that we have is from 1735, at least that I'm familiar with, there's earlier manuals. With the Scottish basket hilt, you see them holding their sword out like this. And then their cuts don't come from the elbow and the shoulder. Their cuts come from the wrist. And so when you start getting that hand protection, you start seeing this style of sword fighting out here in front. But when you don't have that hand protection, you got to get your hand out of the way. By the way, one of those other Zach Wilde techniques that promise you he's not a pirate, wink, it's called the Grand Compass. And it's kind of neat. All that the Grand Compass is, is a cut that is vertical. I'm sorry, it's a horizontal cut, but it's held high. And it's so powerful that it spins all the way around your head. So it looks like this. Ha ha, ha ha. I like it. It's just one of those things that he kind of shows out of nowhere. But it's piratey. Yar. Say it again. So the style that carries over to current sword fighting, which I guess I would call current sword fighting like sport fencing, you're asking the perfect question because it's a perfect segue into the next weapon that we're going to be talking about, which are these two over here. So the next weapon, and the last true weapon style, oh, I do want to talk, talk about this artifact before we jump over to that. This is another artifact. This right here is a early to mid-1700s infantry cutlass. And I say infantry because this definitely is, or at least is inspired by, a military sword. And I say that because, you guys might be able to see it, we have a brass single piece hand guard and grip. This entire section right here is one piece of metal. Not multiple pieces, but one that looks and designed and shaped to be multiple pieces. But, because the infantry would often be going on campaign, 
You don't want to give them leather guards with multiple pieces or shark skin or, or dogfish skin grips with different wire wrappings. That's going to fall apart. You want to give them a nice, practical, and most importantly, cheap style of sword which is this one here, and it does show similarities to something that we refer to as a Model 1747, but it has a bit of variations from it, if any sword nerds are out in the audience. But there's one other thing I want to show you, and I don't often do this with artifacts, but I really, really have to show you with this particular one, because I really want to talk about the quality of swordsmanship or of, of construction that goes into these swords. So what we have here is the blade of an original 18th century curved sword, similar to what the pirates would be using. And I don't normally do this, but I want to show you here. Bend. Boing. Beautiful, well-tempered spring steel that is incredibly light. This is such an incredibly light weapon that it's so, I don't know how to describe it. None of my modern replica swords can even come close to the quality. If I try to put that same amount of pressure onto this modern replica blade. And if I were to force it, it would either snap or it would bend and stay bent. You just don't get that quality that you would get uh, from the original swords. So if you ever get the opportunity, not today, to hold an original sword and swing it around, please don't, it's a public library, uh, you'll feel that it's just that, oh, it's almost like it's meant for it, not meant to be hanging on the wall in your man cave. <laughs> so, let me introduce you to our last variety of weapon today. That is this. Here's another original artifact. This is a type of sword referred to as a small sword. And it's referred to as a small sword because it's real small. It's a question. That is a great question. I will answer that right away. As was observed, this blade is very small, but very sharp. And it is, in fact, intentionally and exclusively sharp right here at the end. If I were to point this at you, and you guys were probably a lot closer, you would see that this blade and the blade of all small swords is not flat like a knife blade, but is instead triangular. One, two, three sides. And each one of those sides is hollow ground, so it actually has a groove in it to remove any of that excessive metal, leaving an incredibly light and nimble blade that is unable to cut. Go ahead. I would think if they, sh if they swinged at someone uh, and hit them in a vital organ, they would probably die straight away. Good conversation to have. <laughs> Say it again. Madam, this is meant for us masculine gentlemen. <laughs> so uh, the topic of, of ladies uh, as, as fighters there were the origins of sport fencing at this time. Uh, you start seeing foils, which are literally the training versions of small swords, and you start seeing women-only sword fighting clubs appear for the first time in Western history. Um, but they are not welcomed as warriors. As, as, as much as I would love to look at history as inspiration for equality, it's not the place to look. Um, uh, even, even and, and talking about a relevant topic, and put this on hold for a quick second, talking about the relevant topic of, of female pirates, uh, we have Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, which are two and only two female pirates from the golden age of piracy that we know of. The only two out of thousands and thousands and thousands of pirates. And they were on the same crew. They were on the same ship. And we have pirate crews that say women weren't allowed to be pirates or women weren't allowed on ships or things like that. And so is the example of Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, who, by the way, were very mythalized at this time, women pirates, let's write books about them and sell them to make profits, which happened all the time in colonial world. 
Um, are those two women the norm or the exception? And unfortunately, all of our evidence shows that they were the exception. Don't get me wrong, the modern pirate mythos allowing for female pirates is awesome. Keep that up. But don't look to history thinking that we're going to find gender equality because unfortunately, it's not there. In front first. So, so the weight per foot on this one is... Much lighter. This is a much lighter. So the question was the weight per foot on this one, much lighter. The Behind you, did you have a question too? Yes, there, oh, don't get me wrong, there are other female pirates, but, yes, and very powerful, and I mean, there were, there were women warriors from history, look at Vietnam, they had twin female warrior empresses, I mean, awesome stuff from history, but specifically Golden Age of Piracy, not the best. In the back! My favorite weapon is a saber. I love curved swords, but I want to point out, and this brings up a good question about this area. Well, we're on a little tangent about questions. We'll, we'll, we'll continue about the small sword after I answer this. A saber at this point in the 1700s is reserved almost exclusively for horseback swords that were curved. The opposite of that would be what I mentioned here before, uh, which would be a hanger or a cutlass, uh, which would be not, and I don't want to, when I say cutlass, I don't want you guys to think, ah, pirate sword. Cutlasses are just shorter curved swords used by anyone, usually on foot. As the years continue, and by the time you get to the 1800s, almost any curved sword is going to be referred to as a saber, but in this era, the golden age of piracy, saber is for horseback and is longer and heavier because you're on top of a massive war beast that you need extra reach in order to hit your opponent. Does that make sense? Cool. Good question, my friend. Let's talk about this guy. We already mentioned that it's triangular bladed, and I want to clarify that because it's triangular bladed, you are unable to slash with it. You're unable to cut with this. This is exclusively for stabbing, which if those of you who are familiar with sport fencing or Olympic fencing, Ah, that's where you get it. Now, the idea of triangular blades is not unique to the small sword. You see an earlier type of sword in Europe called an estoc, which is a two-handed anti-armor weapon that had this thick triangular blade because it's made for putting so much force to puncture through chain or possibly even plate. And you also get weapons like this, which is the next development of the bayonet after the plug bayonet we talked about earlier. This is a socket bayonet called so because it has a socket. Wow, yay, naming conventions. <laughs> Don't overcomplicate them. But it latches onto the end of your musket and, again, turns it into a polearm, but in this case, exclusively for stabbing, just like the small sword. Now, I also want to keep in mind, or I want to reiterate, I mentioned before that this type of weapon is for the upper class, and it certainly is, because the upper class likes to show off. This is another original example, probably the fancier of the two I've brought today. And you guys can't see it from back there, but I'll demonstrate it for you. We've got uh, Celtic knotted rings at the top and bottom of the grip with alternating twisted wire and flat wire ribbon alternating around the handle, ending in what is referred to as a faceted olive pommel made to resemble a jewel or a gem. And that's just one of many different designs of this sword. You might even see these little um, finger rings. They're actually vestigial. You're not actually putting your finger through there. They're leftovers from its predecessor, the rapier of the early 1600s, which did have that. But this is the shrunk down and also fancier version. Uh, very, very light. Now, in my research... While it's very, very difficult to find swordsmanship manuals explaining uh, how to fight with a broadsword, we have an absolute ton of manuals from all over Europe explaining how to fight with the small sword. Because if you're a rich, educated, you know, world on a silver platter person, uh, you're going to know how to read, you're going to have a small sword on your side because <laughs> you're a man. 
and you might as well know how to use it. Now, there's two big philosophical schools of thought that we have for uh, small sword fighting. One is very popular by the Navy, uh, especially the English Navy, and that is where you have your torso turned sideways, your arm fully extended, and then your left hand out like this for balance and also because you got to look good. And the, this is very beneficial because you can move your hand in just a small little way to offset any oncoming swords. But then when you wanted to thrust, three things happen. You reach your sword forward with your arm and your torso. You throw your left hand down beside you and you take a step forward with your front foot. So it looks like this. Ha, ha. And then you step back to parry and then forward again to lunge. Parry, stab, parry, stab. And of course, it goes on and on like that until someone gets impaled. But there's a different style that I think is much more appropriate for pirates. And this is where instead of having your torso fully flat and your left hand back, you actually bring your left hand forward and twist your torso three quarters to the side so that you have it up here by your ear. Now, by doing this, you've made your torso, your torso a larger target, but you also have brought your second hand up to be an active part of fighting. Remember, this ain't sharp. You can grab it and they can slice your hand all you want, but it's not gonna hurt. So you have your hand up here. You can still thrust forward and do damage, but if your opponent happens to throw a thrust at you and you've parried it, you've offset it a little bit, your hand is right here and you can grab it. And their sword's way out here and you can go, ha ha, sucker. <laughs> or to bring it in, <laughs> To bring it even more so for pirates, you don't have to impale them. You can just threaten their life and then ask them where their gold is. In f <laughs> That's good sword fighting. But in fact, there's one particular technique, which is I'm going to try to do it with one person. And that is where if your opponent thrusts at you and you're able to parry it with your sword, with your sword in your right hand, you can actually take your right hand here, which is often, I'm sorry, your left hand right here, which is often held pinky up because you can thrust it out forward, grab the hilt here, and at the same time push with your sword and twist with your hand. And by doing that, you have twisted your opponent's sword out of their hand farther than their right hand can possibly twist, easily disarming them, and now not only do they have no sword? Not only do you have two swords, not only do they have wet breeches, <laughs> they are also at your mercy to tell you where the gold is. And I think that's very popular. Now, I want to... I want to let you know, this is normally the point in the presentation where I tell you how the golden age of piracy ended. I usually tell the story of Edward Teach, and, or who's also known as Blackbeard, who terrorized the Atlantic Ocean and actually was so mythalized that we actually don't know whether or not he lit his beard on fire to give him that smoky thing. That might have been made up to sell books. But we do have one news article that apparently asked the crew on how Blackbeard died, and to very simplify it, he died in a sword fight. Uh, the English Lieutenant Maynard had a crew specifically designed to hunt down Blackbeard. They cornered him, I'm very simplifying the story for the sake of time, they cornered him uh, and got into a duel with him and his crew, and it actually came down to Maynard and Blackbeard fighting each other. Maynard had himself likely a small sword because he's an English gentleman. Blackbeard likely had himself a broadsword because he was a smart, practical pirate. And they engage in a fight. And, as you might expect, the small sword breaks. It snaps and Maynard loses his sword. And it looks as if Blackbeard is about to kill Maynard, but one of Maynard's crewmates jumps up and this guy happens to be a Scotsman who happens to be wielding one of those basket-hilted broadswords we mentioned earlier. And he attempts to cut at Blackbeard's neck to decapitate him. It does not work. Blackbeard says something epic like, ah, it'll take more than that to kill me. And then the Scotsman said something equally epic back like, then I'll try twice as hard. 
and then actually does strike and successfully hit Blackbeard in the neck, who then becomes decapitated, and as the gross, horrible, horrible pirate myth says, his decapitated body swims around the boat three times, which is so true, I can't believe it. <laughs> With the death of Blackbeard also dies this kind of glorifying the pirate myth, you know, glorifying the, the outlaw, because no longer do they have this horrible scourge of the seas. There's no iconography, there's no person behind it. At the same time, just like how Blackbeard died, the rest of piracy is also quelled because the navies, the true navies, are brought to the New World, and the colonies are no longer these frontier places, but are true massive population centers, so much so that this crazy conjunction of 13 colonies, just a few decades later, fights and wins a war for its independence. Uh, so they're no longer these foreign places, and piracy no longer ha big mainstream piracy no longer has an actual place the way it did during the golden age of piracy. But we're here in Tampa. <laughs> so there's this big party that I hear you guys are having next weekend. It's called Gasparilla, which is the name of the iconic Tampa pirate Jose Gaspar. So here is the story of Jose Gaspar. This is the end of, of, of my presentation here. Ho Jose Gaspar. Here's the story of Jose Gaspar. He was born in 1754 in Spain. And he decided to turn his life over to piracy. So he packed up his fancy mustache and little beard and went over to the Gulf of Mexico and terrorized coastal cities along Mexico, Texas, the American coast, and, of course, Florida. Successfully making these raids and amassing a massive amount of wealth, which he then buried on this little-known island that we nowadays know as Gaspar or Gasparilla Island. Remember how I was talking about primary sources this entire presentation? <laughs> Remember how I was talking about the importance of using period, image, period works to actually understand the history? I'm going to bear some bad news to you guys, you tam Tampanians, tam Tampians, <laughs> Tampa folk. <laughs> In the 1700s, there is zero record of any pirate named Jose Gaspar. In the 1800s, there is zero record of any pirate named Jose Gaspar. Do you want to know the first time Jose Gaspar is mentioned in a surviving document? <laughs> it, was, it was from 1904, and it was a brochure for Gasparilla Inn on Gasparilla Island. And the author says, this work is fiction. But there's a problem. Problem for everyone except for the person who runs the island who is now raking in the dough. In 1923, Jose Gaspar makes his way into a true pirate history book. And that is spread across the country. And Jose Gaspar makes his place as a real pirate. And thus enters the confusion of whether Jose Gaspar was a real fellow or not. Uh, but if you look at the primary sources, and if you know anything about capitalism, <laughs> Jose Gaspar was a mascot. He was right up there with Tony the Tiger. Uh, <laughs> They're great. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that's unimportant. That doesn't mean Gasparilla celebration isn't massively important to the community and a staple party that people look forward to every single year. It shows just how important these pirates are and their history is to us as a culture. But I have one special treat for you, one final treat for you guys. Even though we might know that Jose Gaspar 
is on the same playing field as Captain Jack Sparrow. <laughs> he does have Spain in the 1750s as his place of origin. And it just so happens that one of the other broadsword manuals that were published in this century comes from Spain in the 1750s. Hooray! We know how Jose Gaspar would have sword fought if he were real. And I'm going to share that with you. This is a, the last publication that I'm going to mention. This is a publication written by Juan Nicolás Perenat uh, of Madrid in Spain. And he is probably a rarity because he, Spain was, while the rest of the Western world was always about the upper class and the lower class, Spain had the long history of the dons and the upper class versus the lower class. And it was very rare that anyone would make any indication that they were associated with the lower class. And so Juan Nicolás Perenat, at the beginning of his swordsmanship manual, which is mostly a small sword manual, does say, I have to share how to fight with a broadsword because my proprietors told me to do a weapon book for every weapon. So I guess I'm going to do this. Please don't think I'm lower class. Spain, fun. But here are some examples of if you were, be, if you were able to identify uh, a Spaniard fighting in the 1750s saber style or cutlass style like, uh, like Gaspar would have fought with. So Perinat requests that we fight with our hand back here behind our head, and he wants us to hold our sword up in this guard, which he refers to as second, uh, which we later on know as hanging guard, but second is really fancy. Please don't notice I'm lower class. And instead of doing a standard step forward with a cut, he requests that we do something with our lower feet, which is called a gathering step. So we will take our left foot, our rear foot, and actually bring it up to our front foot as a precursor to a cut so that I can then lunge forward even farther and with more force with my saber cut. And that's kind of neat. And also, if you step back, you can kind of push your enemy forward because you're no longer stepping back to your original position. You are stepping forward. Oh, I'm sorry, you're gathering, stepping forward, back to parry, gathering, forward, back to parry, gathering. So you can actually move slightly forward as you're sword fighting. And there's all sorts of other unique things. He tells you to aim for the upper, uh, the upper head for a first cut. He tells you to use the false edge, uh, which is the sharp little few inches at the end of the back of the sword, to cut at your opponent's wrist from below. But there's one technique that I want to end with, which is hilarious. And if Paranaut ever knew that his weird, crazy technique was done on a stage in front of people 300 years later, he'd be happy. <laughs> Because no one's doing this for real. In his book, he has a depiction of, uh, of a swordsman, and it looks a little bit like this. <laughs> and I looked at that, and I went, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so he has himself about a paragraph's worth of description on this. And he calls this technique the flourish or the skirmish. And he describes it with very unfortunate lack of details, but he calls it a, a horizontal figure eight at eye level. And so, and it should be a technique that you use when you are surrounded. So it's supposed to theoretically look like this. <sighs> I'm surrounded, please <laughs> let me go. And he clarifies, because it makes so much sense, that as you're doing your horizontal figure of eight, occasionally someone is going to try to cut at you, apparently, when they're not laughing. And if you cling with an opponent's sword, that is the only time that you are supposed to take a step forward. So here we go. Cling. <laughs> Clang! <laughs> and apparently that'll eventually get you out of being surrounded because your enemies are all laughing their butts off. <laughs> That's how you defeat a Spanish pirate from the 1700s. You surround him.
With that, I want to open up the floor to our overall question and answer section. And don't worry, I'll try to answer all your questions. And at the very end, when we're all finished with the questions, you can come up and get a close-up view of the artifacts as well. So, first question, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So the, the question was, ooh, wow, that's loud. The question was, what is an epe? Uh, and it has two answers. One, epe is one of the three weapons that Olympic fencers use today. Uh, so they have foil, saber, and epe. And epe is their kind of heavy weapon, which is hilarious because it's not heavy. Uh, and I do want to point out, a lot of people know about sport fencing. It's very popular. It's in the Olympics but it's very far removed from sword fighting. It is a sport that uses weapons that they call swords, but it's not. However, historically, especially in the Napoleonic era, there was a development from the small sword, which got rid of a triangular cross section and replaced it with this kind of diamond looking cross section. And it was very deadly and very strong. And they would refer to that as an epée, usually an epée de soldat or soldier's epée. Uh, is the name for that one. And again, it is a stab only, very powerful. In fact, I have an original in the museum's collection, and it's gorgeous. I love it. Um, but I don't have enough swords to do a Napoleonic War lecture, so I don't bring that. I'm not familiar with that part of the story, oh. Captiva Island. Is that, one, is that the one where Gaspar supposedly buried his treasure and there's seven billion zillion dollars worth of gold? and Uh, America, uh, America at the time of the at the time of the actual myth of Gaspar in the early 1900s was going through an outdoorsman craze. Traveling was brand new. Tourism was brand new. You see it all over the place. I mean, people would come here to Tampa to fish for tarpons from across the country, uh, and you'd of course you'd have women coming with too. And very likely that story appeared because the ladies didn't really want to go fishing with their dudes. Uh, so they're, you know, hoping they got captured by Jose Gaspar. <laughs> epe, epe follow-up, yes. Uh, epes were very long, uh, and, if, and, and they tapered towards the end to get an additional range. They weren't as long as rapiers. Rapiers are probably the longest one-handed sword that came up, aside from weird random versions. But the epe was designed to be long for stabbing, rather than like a shorter rondelle dagger, or stab, like a little shanker. This was a more... It was basically the small sword techniques just put in a different shape. Kid time. Kid question. So, like, with that last move? Yeah. So, like, yeah, so the, the question was with that last move, um, the, the flourish that we did, what would happen if someone was behind you? You'd probably get stabbed from behind. You could turn, yeah, and, and definitely we could logic our way through this and try real hard to make it a valid technique. But you also have to remember that um, there's a lot more at play than just our practical mindset that we have in the 21st century, especially in the era of the 1700s when you have the upper class and the rich elite that you're trying to please and the lower class illiterate that you're trying to separate yourself with. And this is a sword for the you know, the lower class. So, haha, look at how, look at how silly those lower class are doing a flourish, trying to flourish. The, theoretically, this is all theoretical, it's all speculation, but we, we don't know because it was a much different culture at the time. Okay, grown up question time. So, I don't have the box that I brought it out here, but it's this long gray triangular or uh, uh, rectangular box. Uh, and I, I flew Allegiant in, uh, and I went up to the Allegiant counter with my box, and I, I put it on the table, and it looks like a gun box. It probably is a gun case originally. And the lady behind the counter goes, is that a gun? And I kid you not, my response was, no, it's swords. And she goes, okay. <laughs> she didn't ask, oh, swords, what's that for? It was just, no, they're good. So, yeah, I mean, there's... Yeah, I can't carry it. I can't carry it on, but 
But yeah, I've, I've, I looked into it. I brought it before. I actually have a little piece of paper that says, like, to whom it may concern, please don't take my swords away from me. They're for education, please. Uh, but, you know, safety concerns. Yes, in the front. If we were on a boat and we did the flourish, the last, the last move, what would I, yeah, exactly, you just, you, well, you're just basically, what well, the question was, what would you do if you're doing the flourishing around a boat and, you know, you can't escape? Well, the answer is you would just be flourishing for your entire life for the rest of your life. <laughs> Until you try to stab someone and then, yeah, usually it's you're in a bad situation when you're doing that in the first place. Good question, though, good. Yes, ma'am, in the front. Um, two questions. What is your museum in Michigan? My, and are you familiar with any other ones? Like, I know there's one in St. Augustine, and I just discovered one in St. Uh, when you say, so the question was, where is my museum located in Michigan? It's called the Swordsmanship Museum and Academy. Like us on Facebook. Um, and as far as I know, it's the only museum that focuses on swords. Uh, there are fencing museums, and there's a few online museums, uh, but I don't know of any others that focus on swordsmanship. And there's also military museums, there's tank museums. Uh, there are, however, groups here in Michigan, I'm sorry, here in Florida, <laughs> that focus on sword fighting. And that is part of a world that is called HEMA, H-E-M-A. It stands for Historical European Martial Arts. And that is the world of taking these manuals that I mentioned and recreating or re restructuring the techniques into a competitive situation. There's tons of those in Florida. I, I made a trip down here and actually gave some presentations on how to sword fight, how to fight for tournaments uh, last time I, or a couple times ago that I was here. So they're great groups, great groups for people of any age. Keep that in mind, too. The name of my museum is the Swordsmanship Museum and Academy in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We actually teach all over West Michigan, but the physical main location is there. Hey, Jerry, if this little girl in the dress can be our last Q&A for the time. Last question, and then you can come on up and take a look at the artifacts. Ma'am, in the front, what was your question? How old do you have to be to fight in the Pirate Navy? How old are you? You have to be four and a half. <laughs> Good job. Good. Awesome. Thank All you, right, everyone. Give a round and of also, to thank Jerry. you for the, to the Pasco District Libraries, and thank you for the Starkey Ranch branch for bringing us in here today. One more round of applause for every single thing going on. Thank you so much.